I hated the jargon when I first started looking at real estate as an investment. There's the cash on cash return, there's the appreciation, loan pay down, ROI, NOI, the cap rate, tax advantages, and internal rate of return. And there's also the harder to quantify things like a business trip to visit my beach house. Ultimately, I just wanted to understand in normal English whether it is better to get a rental property versus, say, putting money into like a boring index fund averaging decent returns. Today, let's talk about the key metrics that measure how a real estate investment property makes money, how to calculate an annual rate of return on a specific investment property, factoring in all the cash flow and equity gains and tax advantages. And I will do this without unnecessarily technical jargon. And then lastly, for anyone who is not as into math or spreadsheets, I have an easier graphical way of visualizing the effects of a rental property investment. Before we dive in though, I wanted to give a special shout out to today's video sponsor, Logify. They're a property management software for short-term rentals that streamlines how I manage my bookings across different platforms like VRBO and Airbnb and direct booking. The calendars are automatically synced and all the messages with guests goes into one unified inbox with one easy to use interface and you can automate messages to guests and your team to make sure everyone is in the loop about every single booking that comes in. You can start your free trial today with my link below and my code Lydia15 will also give you a discount to their most popular plans if you choose to incorporate this into your business. Business. Thank you again, Logify, for partnering with us on this video. And with that, let's dive into the five ways a real estate investment can make you money cash flow, appreciation, loan pay down, tax advantages, and some other benefits. We'll talk more about each metric in detail. The first one is cash flow, and it is exactly as it sounds cash that is flowing in minus cash that is going out. For most short term rentals, this is your payout from Airbnb, VRBO, wherever, minus your expenses like the mortgage, the cleaning fees, any other other maintenance expenses. I just did a video on all the expenses that go into running a short-term rental, and so I'll leave that in the description box below. Why cash flow is useful is because A, this is kind of how you feel at the end of the month. Did you actually make positive monies in your bank account? And B, it also represents the income that you're receiving and able to use each month if you're hoping to use real estate income slash cash flow to quit your job or scale back from your normal day job. For example, if your Airbnb brings in a revenue of $10,000 per month minus $8,000 of expenses, then each month you're getting $2,000 of cash flow. Related to this metric is the cash on cash return. Using that same example of $2,000 of cash flow per month, that is $24,000 per year. If your initial upfront investment into this property was $200,000, then you would divide 24K by 200K and end up with a 12% cash on cash return. What cash flow doesn't account for is the amount of money that you are putting towards the mortgage each month because as you're paying down your mortgage, part of that goes towards the principal of the house. You didn't just spend that money away, it's still kind of yours, just illiquid. There are also other gains that aren't immediately realized like cash. And that brings us to the second metric, appreciation. Appreciation refers to the increase in property value over time. Historically, for a residential real estate in the US, it has been 3 to 5% per year. However, this increase is not guaranteed. It varies by year, it varies by market. And also keep in mind, after adjusting for inflation, appreciation is actually quite modest and even flat sometimes. In my opinion, appreciation alone is not big enough gains to be worth the hassle of investing in real estate. Nonetheless, this is still an important component to include. The third metric is the equity gain from loan pay down. If you purchase a property through a loan, each month as you're paying that mortgage, part of it goes towards interest, but also a small part of it goes towards the principal. Gradually, as you pay more and more of this principal, you're gaining more equity of that property. In other words, you start to truly own a bigger and bigger portion of this house. This is what people mean when they talk about the power of using leverage or borrowed money to finance a bigger purchase than you otherwise would have been able to. Say, if you had $200,000 to invest, option A, you could buy a $200,000 property, ignoring closing costs and all the other things. Just follow along with this example. A $200,000 property appreciating at 5% per year. In the next year, this same property would be worth $210,000. Now you have gained $10,000 in equity due to appreciation. Or in option B, you could use the $200,000 to buy five properties worth $200,000 each. 
but you're only investing $40,000 per property or a 20% down payment. The upfront investment cost is exactly the same $200,000, but now you have financed the rest of it for say a 7% loan at a 30 year term. Using a mortgage calculator, you can figure out for each property, you're paying down $1,600 of the principal during that first year. Across five properties, that is $8,000. Additionally, each of these properties is also increasing in value by 5%, just like in the first option. So instead of the $10,000 in equity gain due to appreciation like that first scenario, now you have $50,000 gained in equity because you have five properties. Combining both the appreciation and the loan pay down, in option B, you are up $58,000, even though you have invested the same amount and the market conditions are the same. Only because you used leverage to access either a bigger property or more properties. Obviously, the trade-off here is that leverage comes with risk. Everything in investing is risk versus reward. And this is a great example of why people find leverage to be such a powerful tool in investing. The fourth metric to consider is tax advantages. Although tax benefits are not really the main reason to choose one investment over the other, at least for me. It is still an important consideration and sometimes it can be hard to quantify, but these are the two main ways that I think about it. One, if you are using real estate income to replace an otherwise like regular job kind of income. If you were to cash flow $8,000 a year from a rental, that may not be the taxable amount because you have depreciation from the property itself. There are other expenses you can deduct such that maybe only 1,000 of this is taxable. Whereas that same $8,000 from a normal job, yeah, the whole thing is taxable at ordinary rate at your highest bracket. So in a scenario where you're thinking, can I scale back from work and and substitute this income from real estate income. If you were to shift $8,000 from your job to $8,000 in real estate, and your top bracket is say 40% combining federal, state, social security, Medicare, all the things, you can kind of think of it as saving $2,800 in tax expense. And I figured that out by taking the difference in the taxable amount multiplied by your top bracket. Alternatively, the other way I think of this is if you're not really using rentals to scale back from work, but you are able to take any real estate losses against your W-2 income, we'll further address who can do this and exactly how in an upcoming interview with an tax expert CPA. So if you have any questions related to tax advantages, tax benefits, tax planning related to real estate investments, please leave them below. We'll make sure to ask them. This isn't that uncommon of a scenario where your cash flow pause Positive, but not by that much. And after taking depreciation of a fairly expensive rental property, you're at a net loss from a tax standpoint. That can be really beneficial tax-wise, especially for some high-income earners. For example, if you have a $4,000 loss for the year in that business and your top tax bracket is 50%, you can think of it as saving $2,000 in taxes for that year. These changes to your tax bill, even if it's a small amount, contribute to the overall returns that you're getting from this investment. The fifth thing that I consider are other benefits. You may have business trips to either visit your property or go to an educational conference to meet up with other real estate investors or learn some new knowledge. You may be traveling to a new location to scout a new investment property possibly. There's also home office expenses and other business deductible expenses, all of these being legitimate tax deductible business expenses, but they are also kind of fun. It's up to you whether you want to count this as part of your return and it's kind of hard to quantify, but I would consider how much more money I would have had to spend on this, say, business trip to the beach house if I were to spend it with post-tax money versus it being a tax deductible expense. In my opinion, these are the five main ones that I consider on a short-term rental property. You may also hear other real estate investors talk about NOI or net operating income, which basically is like cash flow without counting the mortgage payment. Some people use cap rate, which is basically NOI 
as a percentage of the value of the property. So again, not factoring any financing. But personally, I haven't found these particularly helpful because I do need to factor in financing in all my scenarios. Now, how do you take all of these different metrics into account and come up with some sort of a percentage that compares apples to apples? Like this rental investment property versus say another property or a completely different thing like a straightforward index fund. There are two methods, one with math and one without. Let's start with the mathematical option with the spreadsheets and whatnot on how to calculate these returns. You can use a metric called IRR or internal rate of return. When I first heard of this, I struggled to find anyone explain it in simple terms, but basically you factor in how much you're putting into this investment, your annual returns in terms of cash flow and any of the tax benefits, other bonuses you're getting, and also the loan pay down and equity gain from appreciation, which become liquidated in that final year in a hypothetical sale. It takes all these numbers together and turn it into an annualized percentage. Let's look at some examples. Let's say you're getting a $500,000 property. You're putting down 100K as your down payment. Again, 7% interest rate for a 30-year loan. You're all in initial costs, including furniture, setup, closing fees, all the stuff comes out to 150k. Now assume this is an Airbnb and the cash flow is $12,000 per year after all of your expenses. If you were to calculate a cash on cash return based on these numbers, this would be an 8% return cash on cash, which is not exciting at all relative to how much risk and time you're putting in and compared to your other investment vehicles. But remember, you are making money in other ways. How much is that worth? Let's assume the market appreciation here is 4% per year. You can adjust that as you wish. And over time, you're also paying down your loan. You can figure out how much that would be in an amortization table. And in this specific scenario, it is between four to $5,000 per year for the first five years. Let's say between tax write-offs and enjoyable business expenses, you get another bonus of $5,000 per year in gains. And you can build a table just like this, showing year zero through five, for example, what your net annual gain or loss is. Year zero, as we said, is negative because of the initial investment. And year one through four, you're getting the cash flow and some of those other benefits from a tax standpoint, your business trips, whatever. And these add up to $17,000 per year. At the end of year five, if you were to sell the property, you would be selling it at an appreciated value of $608,000. And your loan balance at this point is also reduced to $376,000. This you can also find from the amortization table at year five, what your remaining balance is. This chunk of equity that you now have is definitely bigger than what you started with. And even after you factor in say 6% for real estate agent commissions and adding in the cash flow for the year, you would end up with $207,000 in year five. You literally just put all of this into Google Sheets or Excel and use the IRR formula, and it returns an annualized rate of 16% for this investment. You can play with this table with all sorts of scenarios. For example, what would happen if you only had $5,000 of cash flow for the year because of all sorts of mishaps? Okay, so then the IRR becomes only 12%. Or you can play with the terms of your leverage. What if the interest rate is different? What if you only put down 10% in the beginning? What if you hold onto the property for longer? Really, you can play it out in all sorts of scenarios and turn that into an annualized percentage. The biggest benefit of this metric is that it includes all the ways that you are making money, like the cash flow, the appreciation, loan pay down, and whatever other tax or other less tangible benefits you want to include, and combines all of that into an annualized percentage that you can now take and compare with another rental property that you're considering or compare it with a different scenario of the same property or compare with another investment vehicle altogether. Like here in this example, is the estimated 16% annualized return worth your hassle and risk? Maybe, maybe not. That's a very personal decision, but at least now you have a number as a starting point. For those of us who are not as into spreadsheets and math, there is a more graphical, visual way to take a look at the returns with minimal math. You can use financial modeling tools and just plug in your data and see what it looks like in X number of years. The one that I've been using is Projection Lab and it's completely free if you don't need it to save your data, which I think is awesome. Or you can get a free premium trial if you just needed 
credit for this one decision. The way it works is you just set up an account and put in like your age and then you add the assets. In this case, you're adding this house or investment property in question and you go to make a plan. Now in the plan, you just need to go to the house and make sure you're adding rental income. You can set it either as a percentage of the value of the house or just try to estimate as closely as you can what revenue that you're bringing in. You can add costs separately elsewhere to um, make sure you have all of that data input it correctly. You can set the rental income and the cost to go up with inflation and you can adjust how much inflation is. You can adjust how much housing can appreciate in this market in your scenario. But after you set it up in the simplest format, you can see that, OK, this investment based on the current assumptions in five years goes from 250K equity to contributing almost 450K of my net worth, combining both the equity of the house at that point, plus the cash flow it has since generated. The cool thing about using a projection tool like this is that you get to see how this specific real estate investment possibility plays out within the context of all your other incomes and investments and as it relates to your financial goals. You can add your other existing investments, whether it's real estate, brokerage accounts, or retirement accounts, what your life expenses are like. And if you have retirement goals, like your markers for when you consider yourself to have financial independence, or markers for coast fire even, which is when you can decidedly coast and no longer further invest into your future because your nest egg is big enough and should just continue to grow on its own. That's how I personally use this tool and I've been paying for the premium subscription since last year. And I'm someone who likes the math and the spreadsheets. I just think this works pretty well in factoring all the assets and appreciation and you can easily adjust something with the slide of a slider bar or a click of a button without redoing an entire spreadsheet yourself. And it helps me build some really easy to understand projections of what if I do nothing and just stay at current course versus what if I divert some of my, say, 403B savings, right? And put that into a pot of money that is intended to purchase the next rental property. What would that rental property have to do in performance to completely outweigh my current plan? What if I sell my beach house? How does all of this affect my financial goals and the timeline? The main downside of this method, I would say, is the tax estimation as it relates to the more advanced tax strategies in real estate. You can't calculate how much a business trip is worth. There is no setting within here that allows you to say this is a positive cash flow business that somehow also is a tax loss on my tax returns and it benefits X thousand dollars per year. So potentially you are underestimating a little bit your real estate returns using this method. That said, it is otherwise a fairly complete tool for financial planning and incorporating real estate into your overall financial goals. It even has some more complex things like, especially for those of you who are in the US and looking to retire early, it will alert you if in your plan there are certain ages where you have early withdrawal penalties penalties and let you test out different Roth conversion ladders and how that saves you taxes in the long run, which I think is pretty advanced. It's just not as advanced in the real estate specific niche. So my final thoughts, all investments have risks and rewards, and it's so important to understand both sides of the equation when you're trying to make a decision. I hope this was helpful. If you have other metrics that you like to use, let us know what they are, how you use them, and why you prefer those. Don't forget to check out Logify if you run an Airbnb and would like to streamline operations and use my code Lydia15. And I will talk to you guys again soon. Bye.